Hello and welcome to the Second Tier Podcast. I'm Ryan Dilks and I'm joined by the Jonathan Hogg to my Troy Deeney. It's Justin Peach. Good day to you, Ryan. Justin, how's it going? It's very good. Finally recovered from the weekend. It was a, it was a stressful one, but uh, yeah, got over it in the end. Yeah, an absolute roller coaster, to say the very least. But now we move on because this episode of the Second Tier, as you probably guessed by the title of this episode, is a preview of the playoffs featuring championship experts and rather egotistically, I'm including myself and Justin under that umbrella. Here are some other people I'm including. Making his second tier debut is the EFL editor for Sky Sports, Simeon Golan. Simeon, hello. Hello. And also here is Benjamin Bloom from the Benjamin Bloom YouTube channel. Benjamin, hello. Can I be El Munier or am I knockout? <laughs> You can be whatever you want to be, my man. <laughs> it's just proving I got the reference. <laughs> <laughs> you are listening to the biggest championship specific podcast, the second tier. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. And it's finally here, ladies and gentlemen, the lottery, the roller coaster, the most dramatic five games in world football for my money. Who could forget Charlie Adams' free kick, Darren Carter's penalty, Derby's comeback against Leeds or Troy Deeney's goal against Leicester. The playoffs always delivers on drama, always delivers on entertainment, and I can't bloody wait. On this show, we're going to assess the four teams involved, figure out their chances, and see if we can all come to some sort of an agreement on who's going to win the playoffs. We'll go through the four teams one by one, and we'll begin with the side who finished sixth, and that is Bournemouth. Now, a few weeks ago, they looked like the team to beat six wins in a row, but they've ended the season with three straight losses, and Justin... It's an alarming run heading into the playoffs. It wouldn't be so bad if they hadn't of well, if they'd have scored in those games, but in those three games combined, they've only had four shots on target. So not only are they are they losing games, but their their biggest asset, which is their forward play, isn't functioning at all. And they're conceding goals and they're coming up against a very tough set of teams that are <laughs> might get the better of them and um yeah it's, it's a big it's a big couple of games for Bournemouth because there's FFP there's uh, a huge wage bill potentially losing players yeah there's a lot at stake here for Bournemouth yeah and Simeon if you were to make a list of negatives around Bournemouth I suppose one of them would be Jonathan Woodgate now of course he had that disastrous season with Middlesbrough last year and while he's done an, a good job overall with the Cherries he is still inexperienced isn't he yeah definitely um Strange one, Jonathan Woodgate. I mean, he got the job in such weird circumstances this season, didn't he? I mean, he was hired as Jason Tindall's assi assistant, I should say, about all, a few days before he got sacked in the end. And now he's been parachuted into this club, which they need to go up for obvious reasons, as you've just said. I had a bit of sympathy with him when he was at Middlesbrough in terms of, well, I did until I interviewed him. He's a bit of a strange guy to talk to, to be honest, at times, <laughs> as I'm sure you've seen from a few of his post-match interviews <laughs> and stuff. Um, uh but yeah, he is, um, he's an interesting character. Middlesbrough, he came in with the sort of, he was there to improve the style, wasn't he? From Tony Pulis. And he was essentially trying to do it with a Tony Pulis squad. And you, he was trying to do too much too quickly, I think. And it, it became a problem for him. And then obviously Neil Warnock came in there and sort of reverted back to the way they were before. So it's hard to judge too much about what he could do at Bournemouth compared to what he did at Middlesbrough, I think it's fair to say. But obviously the inexperience will come into it and it will come into it now, I think, against a couple of managers with a lot more manager experience and a lot more manager experience in the playoffs as well. Obviously, Thomas Frank Brentford, maybe Swansea, Steve Cooper as well. You don't know what's going to happen beyond the semi-final. So. Yeah, it's interesting that he has been parachuted into this situation, Benjamin. Um, and when it comes to making the big tactical decisions at the right time in such a big occasion, he's got to get it right, hasn't he? And he's coming up against three other managers who have shown themselves to be very tactically astute in the championship. I totally agree with the um, the point going from Pulis to um, Woodgate to Warnock. Um, without sounding highfalutin, he feels like a kind of what I call a philosophy manager, where you, you you lay down the whole blueprint and it's not a Mick McCarthy tweaking from the sidelines, like you you know, these wily managers who spot things before, you know, even players do a lot of the time. It does feel very much like plan A, plan A, plan A. But still plenty of star power in there. And the point you made about the um the winning streak, whether it's six, six, seven games, whatever it was, um, Dan Juma, Billing, Solanke. 
Brooks looked like he'd started to maybe get going as well. Pearson was locking up the midfield with with Lerma. There's still plenty of star quality in the um, in the team, but I totally take your point that where it's completely fine margins, the game does feel like it can be won in the dugout sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. And you do make a very valid point because, Justin, if despite Brentford's recent form and an inexperienced manager, you look at that squad and you think this is by far the best squad out of the teams in the playoffs. Undoubtedly. Um, you look at the, the likes of Dan Juma, Solanke, uh, Lerma. Uh, Lerma played at the World Cup for Colombia. There's, there's big game experience in this squad. Um, so you can't you can't rule them out based purely on the players that they have. Steve Cook's been there and done it. Begovic, goodness me, he's, he's been around the block as well. There's just so much experience in this team um, that you, you, you just you can't rule them out, even with even with an ex, inexperienced manager, because just on the off on the off chance, on a whim, really, you've got the likes of Dan Juma who can win a game by himself. Um, there's there's Stanislas who has had his best season, I think, in his career. So there's there's just a lot of really good players, almost too good for the championship. But as we know, there's there's no player too good for the championship. Simeon, is it a case of just Jonathan Mudgate saying to these players, go out there and do your thing because you are so talented that if you just play your own game, you get somewhere? I think that is probably the best thing he can do because they they, they, they remind me a bit of Fulham last season in terms of they should have been closer to the top two than they were in the end with the squad they have, undoubtedly. They're in the playoffs, but it's not really a success that they're in the playoffs. With We know how hard it is to bounce back from the Premier League to the Championship, back to the Premier League. But with the team they have, I mean, even players like Dan Juma, for example, who weren't even particularly prominent in their Premier League squad, have come in and been one of the best players in this league this season. They should be higher up. And that is why there is an amount of pressure on them. And that is why... That is, yeah, Woodgate has to just do what he can to get the best out of his squad. Because he said, inexperienced, we don't know how good a manager Woodgate is really. He hasn't proven anything at this level. So the best thing he can do is just let the players kind of get on with the job in as many ways as he can, essentially, I think. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Benjamin, can you pick out a standout individual from this side that is littered with unbelievable players? I'm repeating what you guys did, Dan Juma, isn't it? Off the um, off the front left hand side, and that month he had during that winning streak. And I think it was you that said it, Ryan, a few minutes back. Goal power might be might be the way because um, what seventy three? So only Norwich and well Brentford, their opponents, have scored more goals in the championship than Bournemouth. Although sometimes in the actual semi final leg, it's defenses that win playoffs rather than um rather than your flair players. Yeah, exactly. Justin, would you agree? Dan Juma is the man to to uh, hopefully fire Bournemouth back into the Premier League? I, I would agree. But also, I think we need to recognise that Dan Juma was out for a long time and, and Bournemouth were... I'd say they were still picking up points. You've got Dominic Solanke there who is so good at dropping into spaces outside of the 18-yard box and playing with his back to goal. And then you've got David Brooks, who's fit. And uh, I've met, I've already mentioned Stanislas. So even if Dan Juma's not on form, they've got players who can who can pick up the slack easily. That's just how how deep their squad is with, with talent. And not only that, but you've got some of the best attacking fullbacks in the league. There's Adam Smith, Jack Stacey, um, the, the left back who his name Rico. is completely Rico. I knew it was Rico. Lloyd yeah, Kelly. He's, he's, yeah, and Lloyd Kelly's role. There's, there's there's just so much talent in this team. You just can't rule them out, but it's whether or not they can turn it on. Because as I mentioned, four shots on target in the last three games against not the best opposition either, uh, other than Brentford. It's not it's not it's not good reading. But you mentioned Brentford. They were down to ten men. Brentford exactly. were for nearly half the game. Wickham, who were bottom, and Stoke, who haven't had a great 2021. So they're in no form whatsoever heading into the playoffs. But we'll have to wait and see to see if it has any impact. We'll get on to the team Bournemouth are playing Brentford a bit later on because we'll talk about the side who came fifth, and that's Barnsley. And that in itself. It's just an absolute fairy tale, isn't it? This team who came so close to getting relegated last season, staying up by the skin of their teeth. And you fast forward less than 12 months later, it's almost nine months later, they're now in the playoffs. And the question is, Simeon, how much of a chance do they have to go a step further and pull off what is almost a minor miracle? 
I mean, they are the outsiders. I don't. I know they finished above Bournemouth, but they are the outsiders going into this. I don't think it would be right to say otherwise. It's it's so good for the league that they're there. With all the talk of Watford and Norwich in the top two this season, how it's becoming almost boxed off, and the, the money there is at the top of the championship. Barnsley have proved this season that any team going into the start of a season can genuinely believe that they have the chance to make the playoffs and get promoted. It's just, it's been incredible. What they've done has just been ridiculous. When you think about the fact they probably could and should have been relegated last season, not should, but obviously they got relegated because of what happened at Wigan. They stayed up rather because of what happened at Wigan as much as anything else. And now they're here and it's just, it's a fantastic story and they play great, exciting football. It's not always the prettiest to watch, but it is so effective. And if, if you're a fan of that kind of thing, just sort of high intensity, high pressure, high pressing football, then it is just brilliant to watch. And they've got some great players too. They have every chance of getting promoted with the teams. It's, it's wide open as far as I'm concerned for them. Yeah, they play rock and roll style mm. football. It's interesting, Justin, because I put out our league table predictions earlier from the start of the season. And I think we had Barnsley about 12th. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, that's quite a big shout, having Barnsley all the way up there when quite a few people had them in the relegation zone or around there. And yet they've got even further and finished in the playoffs. So do you agree with Simeon that maybe they can go a step further and get into the Premier League? I have Barnsley tinted glasses on here. I'm I'm all Barnsley. I absolutely love them. And as Simeon was saying, it's not always the prettiest football. I, I, I liken them to a bit like a Volvo. They're they're a bit under under the radar, they're, they're, but they're very safe. They're very quick, um, and they're a good they're a very good car. But you wouldn't go for a Volvo, would you? You know, you'd go for something sexier, like a, I don't know, a, I don't know, Mercedes or something. But get a Volvo. Volvos are good, and and this is <laughs> this is. This is not an ad, by the way. <laughs> it's um, an ad for Mercedes. Buy a Mercedes now. <laughs> um, but this is what the, the Barnsley side are. They, they they have gone under the radar, but I, I really do fancy them. The reason why I do is because teams have to adapt to play Barnsley. I, I remember the Reading game a few a few weeks ago now, or probably a bit longer than that. Reading were just pinned back for the whole game. It was just ridiculous watching. And um, as I'm saying, but, uh, teams have to adapt to Barnsley. And um, for me for that reason I, I fancy them to, to go the whole way yeah we we could talk about the relentless pressing benjamin we all know that's barnsley's brand and the three other sides in the playoffs like to play out from the back they won't want to come up against a barnsley team who gives you very little time on the ball will they no but they've come up against i think the worst team that they could have come up against because they come up against the one team in the playoffs that knows how to defend better than all the other all the other three teams when I saw the teams, Ryan, yesterday and I saw the Bournemouth team, the first thing I said was that smacks of their trying to avoid Brentford. And I think Barnsley would have would have taken Brentford. We all saw that Valentine's Day game where Barnsley visit Brentford and I'm watching it and, oh, they've taken the lead. OK, Brentford will win 2-1. Oh, they're still pressing. Oh, no, they haven't. Oh, he's taken all three forwards off and putting it. Yeah, they said, oh, they've gone 2-0 up. Oh, they're winning. Oh, do you know, do you know what I mean? And... It was thrilling. Um, so I think Barnsley would have preferred Brentford. It's interesting as well when you take a um, a style like Barnsley's and put it in a two-leg game as well, where it is very, very in your face, up and out, and all the, all the things you've said. I think they've got a tricky opponent in Swansea though, Ryan. Yeah, that's what you've been saying, actually, Justin, that you don't think um, Barnsley would have wanted to come up against Swansea. Why was that? They're, I mean, I wouldn't say they're, they're a very defensive team, but as as Benjamin was saying, they know how to defend. Their 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 main game plans this season are get a goal, defend, and they've been very good at it. I think they've they've won the most games to with with clean sheets this season, and that's that's mainly the the reason why. So Barnsley coming up against a team who likes to sit back, who have Jamal Lowe, who can who can counter teams quite quickly. Connor Roberts is a flying winger. We we saw against Derby that he can pop up anywhere. Um, which is not the best solution for Barnsley because of how high they play. The, the line is just it's almost in the opposition half. Um, and, and Swansea and Steve Cooper, they're very good tacticians and they will look to exploit it. That's the reason why. Fair enough. A major concern for Barnsley will be their record against the top six. They've only managed to win three from 10 games this season against those sides. Simeon, why do you think they've struggled against those top, top teams this season? Uh, I don't think it's that 
huge a concern for them. A lot of those games were in the first half of the season when they aren't the same side they are now. They've lost twice to Swansea this season. Both games were before sort of February when before Daryl DK had arrived, before Carlton Morris had arrived. And it was when it was before this crazy run started while they were still kind of forming into the side they are now under Ismail, I think. So I don't think it'll be that much of a worry for them. Also, the pressure's completely off Barnsley in this issue, in this situation. They don't have to worry about FFP. Brentford obviously never been in the Premier League, but Brentford have the pressure of the fact that they keep not getting to the Premier League over the last few years. Swansea have more on them to go up, let's say, than Barnsley. I don't I don't think they'll be concerned in the slightest by the results they've had this season against the big teams just because of how different their team is now to what it was at the start of the season. Yeah. Benjamin, would you agree with that? It's a bit of a free hit for Barnsley. Yeah, I'd agree 100%. I'd done the same research that Simeon had done and you'd seen that. Apologies. No, no, no. You'd seen, no, I was nodding along when you were saying it about when the games occurred. And DK arrived at the end of January and that Brentford game I alluded to was his debut. So you do have to kind of judge them in different terms. I, did, I do remember watching the Barnsley-Swansea game and whilst I don't remember in um, granular detail, I remember thinking, oh, Cooper's got their number here. As in, you know, this uh, obviously at its worst, we saw the game between Derby and Barnsley, where it was just literally grenades from either end. But Cooper seemed to have the measure of the, the transition and quickly over the defence that Justin mentioned that are literally at the halfway line. And I mean, it's, it's thrilling to watch, but there is... There is openings there, but um, it sounds like I'm down on Barnsley. They've been absolutely um, incredible. And I totally agree with the point that um, a lot of people would rather, given two year one parachute teams are already promoted, a lot of people would like to see um, someone who's come from League One two seasons ago go all the way through just to, you know, just to fly the flag for the, um, for the people that don't have five times more broadcast money than everybody else. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely the side for the neutrals, aren't they, Justin? Definitely, definitely. And uh, uh, well, I, I say I'll be flying the Barnsley flag. I, I will be. I, I was looking at Barnsley shirts at the weekend as well. Um, I'm, I'm that indebted to them. Um, and <laughs> I think going into the Premier League as well, if they if they do get promoted, I, I just can't imagine teams will be able to cope with them. It will be nothing like um, the big the big six have seen before. We saw Chelsea struggle a little bit in the FA Cup game. You know, they used to team sitting back. Barnsley won't do that. They they, they they'll go hell forever. And I love that. And, and I think um, I think teams well, shouldn't aspire to be like Barnsley but have the same sort of attitude uh, to them just just go for games that's all you've got to do especially in the playoffs I think if I could just offer my two cents I think one of the reasons why Barnsley may have struggled against some of the top sides this season is well the teams that have beaten them tends to actually just play through the press whereas you, you were just alluding to that um derby game benjamin where it was just long ball from both sides for pretty much 90 minutes barnsley are more than happy for that to be the case they're more than happy for long ball to be you know try and ping it over the opposition defense because it just doesn't work whereas the likes of norwich for example they've tried to play through and if you're good enough to play through then it tends to work um so it's just a matter of whether barnsley can continue pressing and try and keep up the uh try and keep up that relentless um defending from the front against these top teams but it'll be interesting to see we'll talk about Swansea right after this break welcome back to the second tier podcast this is the preview show for the playoffs with experts championship experts and the team Barnsley will be coming up against is Swansea who finished fourth and Simon you were just saying a second ago that you think Barnsley are the outsiders heading into this I was getting the feeling from the vast majority of people that when it comes to the playoffs because of their recent form that Swansea were actually the outsiders but why, why would you disagree with that I mean, Swansea, the, Swan, the issue with Swansea in the last few months has been the size of their squad and the reliance on Andre Ayew and Jamal O for goals. They've both looked exhausted for a month or two, but I, I have a feeling after the last few weeks, and hopefully if they have a bit of a break and a recharge, they'll be fresh again. Swansea's best 11 in tip-top shape and tip-top form is as good as anything else in the championship this season. We've seen from their results this season. We've seen from the teams they've beaten on their day. It's just they got tired for a couple of months. And if they can be fresh and if Steve Cooper can sort out 
the sort of the, the system and how he wants to play, then they will. I, I don't see them as the outsiders, quite frankly. I think people forget a couple of months ago, there was talk of them when they beat Norwich, there was talk of them being the team that are going to come second. And then obviously Watford went on this ridiculous rampage and overtook them. But for me, Swansea are, are right up there as second, maybe not favourites for me, but second favourites, I'd say, for the playoffs this season. Interesting. Benjamin, what would you say? Would, would you say Swansea, Barnsley, the outsiders? Um, I don't know. Um, in, in respects of Swansea, I think Cooper is the one guy out of the four managers who would be able to play chess during the game and not be saying, I hope this goes my way and I'll make some subs at 60 minutes if it's not. I think he's the, he's the more tactical of um you know what i mean an in-game um in terms of changing them and uh believe me i'm an ipswich fan i've seen a lot of playoff semi-finals <laughs> um so sometimes it is that tweaking and really really tight games that you know just need that um little problem solved and sometimes that comes from the dugout as we mentioned um earlier the issue i've got is if you'd asked me three months ago ryan i would have told you the swansea team and the formation as well and then we sort of went to this four at the back and Roberts, who'd been pretty much one of the best players in the league, really, at right wing back, is, well, well now we can't use him in that in that strategy. And Hurahan, who seemed to be the final piece, well, we're going to take him out and put him on the bench and, you know, 4-3-3 and Routledge is going to play and Cullen's going to start coming up front. So I'm a bit uncertain as to, um, as to you know, what he's going to try and do. I dare say, because the opponent is Barnsley, we might see a match up and it'll be three at the back versus three at the back to just try and um, stem the swarm of Barnsley players coming forward. But um, big game players, you've already mentioned, Ayu, Hurahan was, at, I was at the game, uh, Villa West Brom, Hurahan, absolutely key. I think he came on as a sub, didn't he, for Glenn Whelan possibly and turned that game. Um, really big game player, Hurahan. And I, I think tactically... Um, if they don't get the, I can't think of another word than swarm. If they can't cope with the swarm of Barnsley, um, I, I think they can they can do it if they can overcome that thing that obviously a lot of teams have struggled to. Yeah, that's quite interesting what Benjamin was saying, Justin, where Steve Cooper's kind of in this um, limbo area right now where he doesn't know whether to go with three at the back, four at the back. We've seen a lot of Swansea over the past few months. Which would you prefer? I'd, I'd almost, I, I don't, I, I, honestly, I don't know. I, would I try to match Barnsley up, or would I try to out tactic, um, out tactic them with with the four at the back? Do you get the best out of Connor Roberts and and Jake Bidwell uh, as fullbacks? Probably not. Um, but you you almost have a, a bit more of a solid midfield um, rather than a, rather than a flat two. So I honestly have no idea. How, but what I would say is, if you've got the likes of AU. Uh, AU in the side, they're going to score goals. I think the issue with Swansea, especially over the last few weeks, is defensively they've 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 stopped doing what they're, they're good at, um, and I don't think that's down to the system. I just think that's down to tiredness. I think that's down to fatigue. I think that's down to game management. I think that's down to key players not quite um, doing the business for Swansea, and I think that's what it comes down to. And this perhaps this last few games where they've had a a bit of a, a bit of a rest mentally, more so mentally, um, going into the playoffs. I think that's going to going to give them more of an edge than perhaps a, an actual two-week rest where they don't have any games. Yeah, you mentioned AU. Simeon, you mentioned AU earlier as well. He is the clear danger man for Swansea, isn't he? And there have been a few question marks about his fitness heading into the playoffs. He managed to complete 60 minutes against Watford at the weekend, but they badly need him to be 100%, don't they? Yeah, I mean, he is their talisman. I know it can be a bit cliche. It's strange because... It feels a bit like last season with Fulham, and I'll keep parking back to playoffs gone by, but Fulham last season, all the talk was about Mitrovic. They don't have a chance with without Mitrovic, basically. And then they essentially got promoted without him. He didn't play across the two semi-finals. And then I know he got an assist late on, but they already won a up. Or he, he assisted the second, but he wasn't hugely involved in the playoff final. He didn't start the game. So there will be a lot of focus on whether AU is 100% or not. And then you never know, he could play or not, but then someone else will come and star for Swansea and be the hero. You mentioned Hurahan, he'll be massive. He has experience in these types of games before Vaston Villa, he's been promoted. And it's quite a young side aside from him and AU. So he will be key as well. Steve Cooper, he'll be key as well. He is, he is a brilliant manager. He is so tactically astute. His main thing that holds him back is the fact he's quite 
shielded and shy. He's he's not the best in interviews. He doesn't sell himself as well as a lot of other managers. I mean, he, when you think about Thomas Frank, for example, and think about Steve Cooper, it's just the difference between them and how they behave is is crazy. I've I've had an interesting couple of altercations with Steve Cooper as well, which <laughs> I'll tell you about after we stop recording. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, he's. I think he'll he'll be very important, and he can. At, on his day out maneuver anyone in the championship and we saw how in the playoff final last season how important the way Scott Parker set Fulham up against Brentford was to them winning the game he completely outsmarted Thomas Frank on the other side when everyone was like Brentford are going to win this game so I think yeah he will be massive but obviously I you can't overlook how important he is to this side in general Justin, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would I think that the point of Steve Cooper is a really important one I mean we've had pelters over the last few months describing Steve Cooper as the best thing that's happened to Swansea in a while. I, I, I certainly have anyway. Um, but we, we forget that the the playoff um, system is almost tournament football. You know, form does go out the window a little bit. Momentum does help, but it does it does drift out the window a little bit. And Steve Cooper's got got previous with, with tournaments. He won, he won the Under-17s World Cup um, with England. I know it's the Under-17s, but he's got that experience where he's got to manage games individually. And um, I think that might edge him over the likes of Ismail Franks and... Um, Woodgate. Yeah, he's um, definitely divided opinion in the Swansea camp at the moment, hasn't he, <clears> Steve <throat> Cooper? But it'll be one hell of a way to silence the critics if he were to manage to get Swansea promoted. Let's move on to the heavy favourites to win the whole thing with the bookies. That's Brentford. They came third. And Benjamin, you tweeted a brilliant stat about them at the weekend. Only four teams in the past 25 years have managed to get more points than them and not get promoted. Are they the team to beat? Yeah, yeah, big style. Um, so 87 points. And um, watchers of my channel will know I sit on my 10-year averages, 45 to survive, 84 gets you up, and they've got 87 and not got up. And, you know, you can reel off a lot of other years. They possibly would have gone up with the 87 points, but wrong place, wrong time, and all that. Um, 79 goals, 87 points. 31 goal striker and like Swansea oh, well the you can transpose Swansea because they went from a four to a three um Brentford and dropped Norgard in which is um which is very ostentatious isn't it oh we're just going to stick a playmaking midfielder at centre back it's quite good fun actually I think but I think mainly to get Fosu in the team just to give Tony a little bit of help because I think mbwemo has been missing his mate Ben Rama um, this season, creating an entire acre of space by drawing five players to him um, at a time. Look, we've all seen the playoffs. We we know that um, there are occasions where, I think Portsmouth and Leicester is the best example, where they finish miles above them and um, sixth beats third. But in the main, and I think my stats are um, 21 to 12, third beats sixth. So it does work in the favour of the third place team and four straight victories and a victory over Bournemouth. And just the way the games are stacked up, I'm sure you all, you guys all watched the game. Brilliant game between Brentford and Bournemouth. And I mean, Bournemouth for the first 15 minutes in that game, I think it's back in the winter sometime, were brilliant. And then Brentford turned it around. I, so I think we're going to get one um quite open game and we're going to get one very very tense game maybe decided on a set play but yes I would make Brentford favourites well they head into the playoffs unbeaten in 12 off the back of four straight wins they are the form team heading into the playoffs but over the past 10 seasons the form team has been promoted just three times having said that Simeon do you think form is important for the playoffs not particularly, no. I think it's something that matters, but it's not overstated. I think there's a big difference between a team like Bournemouth, who were obviously knew they were going to be in the playoffs and then lost a few games towards the end of the season. I don't think that matters, rather than the team, say, who were challenged for automatic promotion and then really, really crawled into the playoffs. I think that can have an impact. I think looking at the form team, it's, it's, I don't think it really matters over the long term. I think these games are too one off two stand out that the, the best teams on the day will just win. I don't think it has a huge impact on that. Having said that, I worry about Brentford in games like this. I really, really do. I I just want to caveat that I I, I have I've always had a soft spot for Brentford. I've I've no bias against them whatsoever, but they have a problem when it comes to when 
when the dream becomes reality for Brentford, they have a problem and they have a mental block and they have for years back and all these kind of historic things that are always talked about in football, oh, they haven't won a game since 1962. I don't think that usually has a bearing on teams. I think it has more of a bearing on fans than the teams. But with Brentford, I think it genuinely does have a bearing. It's just even micro instances during the season, whenever they're chasing, they're the best team in the championship. As soon as they have a genuine opportunity of getting over the line or getting, even Dean Smith just a couple of years ago, getting into the playoffs, as soon as it happens... They always fall short. We saw it last season. They played Swansea in the semi-finals, bad in the first leg. In the second leg, when they're chasing and they won, in the final, they barely even turned up. And it just it feels like they have an issue this season. Whenever Watford looked like slipping, Brentford slipped as well when they were chasing them. When it, towards the end of the season, they went on that run of draws when a few wins would have really, really kept the pressure up. I don't honestly see how they are favourites for the playoffs, and I'd like to apologise to all Brentford fans for that because I don't think they're going to win the playoffs That's as it stands. Yeah, that, that's and, very interesting. We'll get onto that a bit later on, Simeon. Um, but of course, they suffered the heartbreak last season, didn't they, Justin, when they lost in the playoff final? And Simeon's quite right. We saw them almost freeze up. But will that experience of what happened last season, will that benefit them? You'd have thought so, but we've seen teams, I mean, Derby have been serial playoff semi-finalists and finalists and they've never been able to bridge that gap ben, ben benjamin mentioned ipswich as well and that they were never able to bridge the gap some teams it just doesn't work out and and i, I want to say i don't think brentford have ever won a playoff campaign in their history um i know i know billy's um from from besotted says that quite a lot and that just tells you exactly it just i mean it just it builds up on on, on simeon's point that they, they freeze on the big stage. I think another issue is certain players, uh, and I will name names, Pontus Janssen, I think is a massive liability in big games. I don't think he's got the discipline to to handle it. I, I, we saw with um, his, his sending off against Bournemouth a couple of weeks ago, we saw him in the playoffs against um, against Derby for Leeds. I just don't think he's got the mentality for big games and quite a big claim to make, but that, that's, that's, that's what I think. I thought, I thought you were going to say he didn't have the bottle. I was like, don't don't bring that up, Justin. <laughs> Simeon, what were you going to say? I was saying, Janssen, he gets too hot-headed in these situations, isn't he? He's, he's, yeah. he's almost too... It reminds me, remember, sort of Joe Hart in the tunnel before big World Cup games kind of thing. He has the same <laughs> kind of... He has that same kind of thing where you can get, oh, he looks fired up for it, but you can get too fired up for these types. Obviously, it depends what kind of character you are, but it seems to... The emotion of these types of games seems to affect him when he can be such a, a sort of a cool-headed defender sometimes, and other times he just completely loses it. It's strange. I think the point... Sorry to keep on going, but the point with Brentford that also needs to be made is it's strange we're talking about a club like Brentford as if they're it's obvious they should be in this situation. They're I mean, I I, I grew up in West London, I've seen Brentford play in every league in the football league, and there are times where they've they've been so bad, it's frightening. So the fact we're talking about them even as fair playoff for the favourites is just such a massive credit to how far they've come because they've never been in the Premier League, they haven't been in the top flight for decades and decades and decades. So it would be fantastic to see them go up. And I don't think it should be as understated if they go up as someone like if Barnsley goes up, because it's just for any team without parachute payments to get promoted from the championship is just, it's it's a brilliant, brilliant achievement. It would be brilliant for them as well if they did manage to go up. And that is, yeah, it's just, it would be as good as if as Barnsley went up. Obviously, Barnsley, the story for this season, but Brentford, it would be incredible as well. Yeah, spot on. They're a club that's been knocking on the door for quite some time, aren't they? And mm. they're, they're ready for the Premier League, quite frankly, yeah. aren't they? Final point on them, Benjamin. If you're an opposition side coming up against Bradford, then you'll go a long way to beating them if you manage to keep Ivan Tony quiet. <laughs> Easier said than done, Ryan, isn't it? Yeah. I know you boys are big on your sort of underlying metrics and, you know, chance quality stuff as well. Brentford just continually, continually... Every season, they're always creating the most chances, conceding the fewest chances, uh, biggest um, difference between. And for those people who like to get overly emotional about what's essentially a probability stat, but they always do very well on the um, on the XG metrics, don't they? However, I do totally agree with the um, points you've all made. And it's, it's standards, isn't it? Because um, you see a club like Norwich in the Championship, and they behave like Manchester United used to under Ferguson. You know, the dugouts out every game. They expect to win. And the standard is they expect to get promoted. And you, you guys are just right on, on Brentford, where there is just not quite that there when they get to the big moment of, nah, 
this is this is my this is my scene and and this is where we win but i do i do passionately agree because you use the word bottle there and i stand up for brentford over and again because they're never favorites in terms of financially in the big picture and the, the fact that they are there and we're talking about them is a big feather in the cap so i do get very frustrated when they are termed bottlers by certain schadenfreudist um influenced <laughs> other fans i think so um good good luck to them good luck to them all well good luck to them all this is the big question boys who do you fancy to win the whole thing i want to get your finalists your winner and why justin we'll go to you first oh uh, it's it's a case of the, the heart says barnsley um but the the, the head's sort of flicking between swansea and 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 brentford um I think I honestly think the winner of the the Barnsley Swansea game will go on to win the, the playoffs. Um, wow. I, I I think they're they're both teams that are just tactically astute, and um, Barnsley have got nothing to lose. Swansea, as we as we mentioned, tactically they, they've got it. Um, so if I'm gonna, I, I'm just gonna go with Barnsley. I'm gonna go with Barnsley because I think I just think they're up for it. I really do. I think that they're, they're, they're well up for it. They've got players like um, Daryl DK and Corey Woodrow. The defence have gone under the radar. Um, Helik and Anderson have been phenomenal this season. Um, uh, Jack Walton's been good, but Brad Collins has been even better in goal. They've got talent all over the pitch. And, and, and in a manager in um, Valerian Ishmael, I don't think we've seen the best of him or truly appreciate how good a coach he is. Um, and I think the playoffs are going to really showcase that because if he doesn't go with Barnsley, for example, he will be in the Bundesliga. It's just, it's just got, it's just got like someone like Frankfurt written all over him, <laughs> um, coming coming to pick him up. Um, and that's it. And that's quite, that's quite a big compliment because they are a big club. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm going to stick with Barnsley. Um, uh, I'm going to be as stubborn as uh, as I was with the Rotherham's um, prediction. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully, Barnsley fans don't see it as a curse. So you're going Barnsley, Brentford in the final. I yeah, Barnsley Brentford for me, and Barnsley to win the whole thing. Benjamin, what are you saying? Um, this is a tricky one for me because I'm actually contractually obliged to give a tip on my own channel, so I will <laughs> read you some stats and uh, avoid the question um, somewhat. Um, you know me; I've got a stick up my backside, and I'm all over the stats. Um, Sixty-four percent third place wins the third place semi-final is what I will say without giving a prediction there much much tighter on fourth and fifth 16 wins to 17 in fifth places favor which um which interests me greatly uh the winners of the playoffs 12 times uh third place nine times fifth place if i'm um edging towards potential um finalists without making a prediction but um no i'm gonna be boring the playoffs is not a lottery and third place are the best team um in it so that that will be my conclusion without making a prediction <laughs> fantastically dodged without actually answering <laughs> the question uh Simeon, you're not contractually obliged to <laughs> not give an answer are you no but i am invariably terrible at actually giving accurate predictions <laughs> Same I, as me. I do you're you're probably aware, you know, Pratt's predictions on Sky Sports. I'm the, yeah. the sort of the, the, the man behind the curtain on those of Pratt's in terms of trying to prod him back in the right direction if I feel he's gone too far, of course. <laughs> and I invariably prod him away from a correct prediction into an incorrect prediction more often than once <laughs> a season. Uh, I I do think, I think Bournemouth will get past Brentford. Swansea, uh, apologies again to Brentford fans. I'm going to sound like I absolutely hate Brentford. I can assure you I don't. They're actually my local team. I do quite like Brentford, but I just... You don't that's, protest that's too my, much. That's, that's my worry as much as anything. Um, Barnsley and Swansea is a coin flip for me, but I think it will just be Swansea. I think they'll just about edge it. And then I will go Bournemouth to win the final. Wow. Sixth well, place. Wow. There we go. I don't... I, I know because it's a strange thing, isn't it? People who don't follow the EFL are always like, oh, the team who comes sixth always wins the playoffs and the team no, who thinks they yeah. never do. And it's it's nonsense. But I don't think Bournemouth are a normal sixth place side this season. I think True. they haven't they haven't just snuck into it. They should be better than they are. They are a lot better than they are in mid season. And it's not often a team will change manager mid season and then finish in the playoffs. It's just I, I, this strongly not looking at the last few games. But I think their team is just too good over the sort of what they have quality wise and over a short spell of three games, I think they'll just have too much for the others. I'm going to go 
And I know the second tier very often gets branded a Brentford biased podcast, but I'm going to go Brentford to win the whole thing. I just think this is finally their time. They've got Ivan Tony, who is one of the best players in the championship this season. They've got quality all over the park. It is just a matter of holding their nerve at the final hurdle. I agree with you, Simeon. Swansea v Barnsley is a coin flip, 50-50 for me. I'm a set play. Set- you go, yeah, I'm edging slightly towards Swansea. So maybe 52-48 in Swansea's uh, favour. But I, I do think Bradford will win the whole thing. I don't think uh, Bournemouth will manage to get past them just because I've got major concerns over A, their form, and also Jonathan Mudgate. So Bournemouth... Uh, Bournemouth to be beaten by Brentford for me and then maybe Swansea to beat Barnsley. But I do think Brentford will win the whole thing. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. The playoffs are upon us. Get ready for five games where hearts will be in mouths for a nerve-wracking finale to the end of the season. Me and Justin will be back on Tuesday to review the first legs of the playoffs and I can't bloody wait. But thank you to our guests on the show this week. Benjamin Bloom from the Benjamin Bloom YouTube channel. Thank you for your time. You got it. <laughs> the EFL digital editor for Sky Sports, Simeon Golan. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure being on. This has been the Second Tier Podcast. I've been Ryan Dilks. I've been Justin Peach. Thank you for listening. <laughs>